The Mariner's Mirror podcast is the world's number one podcast dedicated to all of maritime and naval history. We bring you the most exciting maritime projects worldwide, with one foot in the present and one in the past. From the age of timber and canvas and tall ships, to one in which ships were made of iron and steel and were powered by engines. The Mariner's Mirror podcast brings you right up to the present day and will change the way that you think about the maritime past forever. Hello everyone and welcome to the Mariner's Mirror podcast. Today we're exploring that age-old topic of piracy. Now I've come to this topic because I recently came across a survey of modern piracy and this is from last year, that's 2021. It shows us the number of incidents or attempted incidents of piracies on the high seas. And there is some interesting results here. There were two in Benin, five in Ghana, six in Nigeria, nine in Indonesia and nine in the Philippines. However, there was a whopping 35 in the Straits of Singapore. We've made an interesting graphic which shows this visually, so do check that out on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. I'm lucky enough to have actually been on piracy patrol in the Straits of Singapore with the excellent Republic of Singapore Navy, who have a significant force, highly trained individuals and a fleet of ships designed for the task. So that's 35 incidents of piracy in spite of their navy. You'll be interested in the names of some of their vessels. A corvette called the Victory, a frigate called Formidable, Formidable, and an amphibious warfare vessel called Endurance. So the Singapore Navy, they're taking some strong inspiration from British naval and maritime history. Singapore is interesting because you have a narrowing in the trade routes there between east and west. You have predictable trade routes. You've also got lots of hiding spots. So it is really perfect for piracy. In the past, all of these three things mattered, but piracy was far, far more widespread. Scholars debate the period when the pirates actually ruled the waves, and the answer certainly depends on the location in question. But by general consensus, it was all over by 1730. Prior to that, valuable maritime trade was fair game for any bold man or woman with local knowledge, a ship, a crew and some gunpowder. And the Caribbean made particularly good hunting ground. Here was regular trade in immense wealth, and yet it happened in poorly charted waters and was protected by only juvenile naval power. To find out more about the golden age of piracy, I spoke with the excellent Dr. Jamie Goodall. Jamie is a historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History. She has a Ph.D. in history from the Ohio State University with specializations in the Atlantic world, early American and military histories. She's also a first generation college student. Her publications include a National Geographic bookazine on global piracy, Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay from the colonial era to the Oyster Wars, and her recently released book, Pirates and Privateers from Long Island Sound to Delaware Bay. Jamie lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and two boxer puppies called TJ and JT. I very much hope you enjoy listening to her as much as I enjoyed talking with her. Here is Jamie. Jamie, thank you very much indeed for talking to me today. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. No worries at all. So, the golden age of piracy. This podcast has been going for over a year, yes, and I woke up in a cold fit the other morning and I realised I hadn't done pirates, so I thought you needed to come on and we could talk about pirates. Let's start with with period. What What is the golden age? What does that mean? Okay, so there's a couple of different sort of periodizations for the golden age, Many scholars sort of look at the entirety of the the spectrum from about 1650 to 1730 as the golden age, and then others sort of pinpoint it more specifically to this uh, period about 1695 to 1713. Uh, so it just kind of depends on 
how you define the golden age and um, how you perceive uh, the impact of piracy at a particular time period uh or uh, at this particular time period yeah what what are your views on that what do you think is the most helpful way of thinking about it so for me i tend to look at the golden age of piracy as operating between about 1650 but i carry it to about 1790 just because i think that even though piracy has diminished quite significantly by the 1730s, we still see pockets of resistance into the uh, later periods. Uh, and so I think 1790 is kind of a good cutoff uh, in terms of discussing pirates in the Atlantic Caribbean world specifically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we were saying so 1650 is a good place to start, and it absolutely is because of the the sudden burst and increase in piracy. But there are obviously origins which predate that as well. Absolutely, aren't there? I mean, pretty much as soon as the Spanish and the British and everyone comes across, it all goes wrong. <laughs> oh yes, definitely. Let's talk a little bit about locations. I'm quite interested in that because if you start reading into piracy, you, you might think that it's, uh, it is focused in, in a pretty small area around the Caribbean, but that wasn't the case. Tell me about what, sort of where piracy happened. Uh, yeah, so of course we tend to focus on the Caribbean islands, specifically islands like Jamaica um, or Barbados, but it sort of expands well beyond that. Uh, we have evidence of pirates operating off the coast of North America from New England down to uh, Florida. Um, we see pirates operating off the coast of Bermuda, which doesn't technically count as part of the Caribbean. Uh, they're operating off the coast of West Africa and into the Gulf of Mexico along the South American coastline. So they're kind of all over the place. They, they really operate wherever it is that's going to bring them the greatest opportunities for seizing a ship. And that sort of changes depending on the year, uh, what sorts of trade regulations are in place. Uh, and so that's sort of the concentration of, of pirates if we're looking at the Atlantic world. But a lot of the Atlantic world pirates also sort of start to shift into the Indian Ocean and uh, East Africa, uh, specifically Madagascar, which was kind of a pirate haven because trade starts to shift into that region uh, in terms of greater riches. And so uh, William Kidd, for example, probably one of the most prominent of our golden age pirates, if you will, he's operating both in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. And so he's not limiting himself or restricting himself to specific geographies. Mm. I mean, the, 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 the question actually, I suppose, is most answered by the presence of trade, because there's, there's great um, proof of uh, uh, piracy in the Roman world, in the Mediterranean, and then, um, you know, 15th, 16th, 17th century out in Asia, Chinese mm -hmm. suffered uh, terribly from piracy, especially those kind of narrowings, like around modern Singapore, where, where yes. trade kind of has to pass. And it's very similar in, um, you know, the, the, the Atlantic world, because, you know, in this age of sail, Mm -hmm. the, the the problem was is that everyone knew where the trade ships were going to arrive <laughs> because they were blown right. there by the wind, which never changed. <laughs> so I thought that was that was fascinating. Um, but anyway, very much linked with trade and linked yes. with empire as well. Um, I always thought it's fascinating the way that piracy rises when wars between European powers diminish. Yes. Um, uh, and um, I suppose to, to understand uh, the growth of piracy, we should talk a little bit about privateering as well to, to establish a difference. So can you tell us the difference between pirates and privateers? Uh, so there's been some debate on, on how to define privateers uh, in comparison to pirates, particularly since contemporaries often used those terms interchangeably. Um, and that was something I found really interesting when I began my research into piracy was that there were a lot of government officials or merchants who didn't distinguish between pirates or privateers. But in terms of legality, a pirate is a commerce raider who operates uh, 
without license and disrupts the shipping of any nation. So they were considered sort of the enemy of all nations, whereas privateers technically were commissioned to disrupt enemy trade. So they were supposed to operate only in times of conflict and they were granted a letter of mark or a commission that could come from the crown. Uh, it could come from a colonial governor, just sort of depends on time and place uh, as to who has the authority to issue those letters of mark. And they were limited in terms of which nation's ships they could attack um, and what made it a legal prize as opposed to an act of piracy. I sort of look at it like this. There, there's only two things really that separate a pirate from a privateer, and that is your letter of mark and the perspective from which you're viewing the act. Because of course the English, when they are issuing letters of mark against the Spanish, um, they believe that they are doing this as a legal operation, at least under English law, and that this is a patriotic sort of event. Uh, they are promoting the growth of the, the English empire. They are um, undermining Catholic superiority, and they, they view this as a, a good thing. Uh, but the Spanish, of course, from their perspective, those letters of mark are meaningless. They are not bound by Spanish law. And to the Spanish, they're just pirates. Uh, they, they do not view them as any sort of legitimate actor. Mm. So, I mean, is there a kind of a generally accepted law of the sea at this stage where everyone agrees about certain rules of behavior? I, I don't really think so. I, I don't think we see any sort of real cooperation in terms of defining some sort of common maritime law until we get to the 1730s-ish. Um, by that point, I think the nations had been fairly firmly established in the developments of their overseas colonial empires. And they sort of realized that it was better for them to work together to stamp out things like piracy than trying to deal with it individually, especially, um, you know, through the 1650s to 1690s, 1700, we sort of see, especially the English pirates, they, for the most part, focused their attacks on foreign ships. They, they tended to leave English ships alone with, with obvious exceptions. By the time we get to 1700 to 1730, uh, the English pirates, for example, are attacking any ship, including English ships. Um, they're actually sort of making English ships a target in ways they hadn't necessarily done so before. And so um, yeah, I think during the height of piracy in this particular region, there's no real consistency <laughs> in how pirates are sort of defined and, and what the uh, implications of piracy are and, and how pirates are treated in terms of the law. Yeah, so that's one of the, one of the ways that piracy actually benefited the maritime world in a very strange way because it did bring people together and and to focus on it so so you know all, all the the eradication and the laws that were produced in the 1730s um very much born from the experiences that had happened in the the previous i don't know 80 years or so let's just go back to 1650 we talked about it all kind of blowing up then why what happened in 1650 by 1650 the english uh who were well behind the Spanish in terms of their colonization efforts. By 650, they've sort of hit their stride in terms of their colonization efforts. And there's a greater push towards disrupting Spanish trade. And there's also greater uh, connections between the different nations and these various port cities, uh, whether those port cities are in North America, South America, the Caribbean, West Africa. And we just see an explosion of trade around that time period. And it becomes a lot more um, effective and a, and a lot more profitable than it had in um, earlier decades. Uh, so it, 
it's sort of, it's a very Anglo-centric sort of situation uh, in the sense that prior to you know, maybe 1630 with the existence of um, William Claiborne in the Chesapeake, we don't have specific uh, instances of multiple piratical incursions uh, that, that we can sort of speak to. And so I, I think a lot of it just has to do with the rise of the English. Mm. I think a lot of it's to do with as well with um, uh, knowledge, or like the eradication of piracy. I'm talking about here to do with um, mm -hmm. knowledge of the area. It's easy to assume that just because the English and the Spanish, were, you know, were were in the Caribbean and in America in the 1650s, that we actually knew what was there, but we didn't. There weren't any kind of detailed charts. <laughs> that all the, all of the really good soundings of the harbors, the detailed charts, all the stuff you need to police an area don't exist <laughs> there is it is this this kind right. of it's a geographically unknown area and um i think that's often 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 overlooked in favor of people worrying about rules you know yes what type of treasure were these pirates after oh that's always my favorite question uh it's one of my favorite myths to bust is that we have this sort of romanticized notion that pirates are out there getting gold and jewels and silks and, and all sorts of, you know, luxurious items. But in reality, um, by the time we hit that sort of rise of piracy and, and its heyday, the Spanish have learned uh, how to successfully protect their, their silver ships, their, their treasure ships, if you will. Uh, and so, you know, it was not in a pirate's best interest usually to try to uh, attack an entire convoy of Spanish ships just to get to a treasure ship. So by and large, pirates are really just stealing everyday commodities, which turn out to be incredibly profitable, but they're stealing um, linens, they are taking timber, they are stealing uh rum and Madeira wine. Uh, so any sort of commodity they can get their hands on. One of the most profitable for pirates they came across them, uh, which was unfortunately uh, the enslaved Africans that are being forcibly transported from West Africa to the colonies. And uh, we have this romantic idea that pirates were these proto egalitarian floating democracies and it's true that some pirates were they were you know what we would consider progressive in that way but a lot of pirates had absolutely no issue participating in the in the barbaric trade of enslaved people so those are the kinds of things that pirates are stealing and then they go to these port cities and they fence that uh, usually in taverns or via auctions and that them the money that they use to uh, live their life in various ways. Yeah, I suppose this question of what they what they're actually doing really does raise the other question of who they are. Who, who are these pirates? Where did they come from? What do we know about their lives? The vast majority of pirates are uh, sort of indistinguishable from the general population. They are average men typically uh, who operated in maritime trades, whether they were, you know, um, working on merchant ships, whether they were uh, members of the Royal Navy. Um, and so they are fathers, they are brothers, they are husbands and, and that sort of thing. And so they're just these generic guys. Um, sure, there were some who were the sort of stereotypical down on the luck, uh, impoverished individuals or those who were just seeking adventure. But by and large, they're just average men, uh, sometimes women. Uh, but uh, I find it really interesting uh, to sort of think about pirates with respect to the idea not only of having a family, um, which we tend to you know, associate pirates as these uh, swashbuckling single men, um, but also their intimate ties to the land. Uh, again, we sort of envision pirates as these, you know, water-bound figures, 
uh, who only touched land to sell their goods and go to brothels and taverns. But we have so much evidence of them settling down and and buying land and investing in their communities, having strong community ties and uh, owning businesses, for example. So um, just this you know, sort of notion that pirates were men who lived normal lives. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really refreshing way of looking at it because we're so so focused on the 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 the, the real stars of the pirate world. Um, you know, the ones who had kind of biographies written about them. Of course, there are so many who just lived lived their lives. I'm always interested in the moment of, of turning pirate. So, so at some point, mm. these guys weren't pirates, right? <laughs> Very few of them were born right. pirates, and they they right. they become. They, at some point, something happens. Um, mm -hmm. Do we know any, anything about that or any good stories? Yeah, so there's a few different uh, primary ways that somebody would decide to turn pirate or go upon the account, as they called it. Uh, the first was through mutiny uh, as a result of uh, being upset about their conditions on either a merchant vessel or as a member of the Royal Navy. So. Um, Particularly in the Royal Navy, a lot of the lower ranking sailors were uh, not treated very well, to say the least. They were brutally beaten. They uh, had their pay withheld. They uh, often had minimal food rations. Uh, the only thing they really had to look forward to was their rum ration. Uh, so mutiny was not uh, necessarily uncommon in those sorts of instances. And so then those who did mutiny uh, would sometimes decide to turn pirate as they viewed it as a profitable enterprise. Uh, the other way is just uh, being a tavern and overhearing somebody say that they're going to go, you know, pirating and being like, yeah, I need the money uh, or I want the adventure. Let me join you. Um, a lot of people were impressed into service on pirate ships. Um, especially if you had the skills that they were looking for, specifically surgeons and navigators. Um, they were very prized on pirate ships. Um, and so those are kind of the primary ways. My favorite way of becoming a pirate <clears throat> would be Steed Bonnet or Stead Bonnet, however you want to say his name. Uh, in that he was a wealthy merchant in Barbados. Uh, he, by all accounts, had this great life. Well, okay, did, he didn't want life anymore. So he ditched his wife and kids, sold his business, bought a ship, and hired a pirate crew. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's not the that. most effective <laughs> way of becoming a pirate. Uh, because, of course, the, the men expected him to continue to pay them rather than operating on the typical um, pay for prey sort of system. Um, he was so ineffective that even Blackbeard was like, you know what, can't can't do this. So uh, he's my favorite example of, of sort of this midlife crisis seeking adventure kind of guy. <laughs> well, that's very good. <laughs> I like the story of William Kidd. Do you know that one? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, he's. He's really interesting, uh, especially after his marriage to Sarah Bradley Cox Ort Kid. She she married a lot, um, but uh, this idea of being solicited as a pirate hunter and then somehow finding yourself instead, while all the time claiming that you're not a pirate. Um, so he he was very interesting in this idea of offering his services to the government and then being like just kidding yeah so i mean very briefly i the, I, I kind of I, I jumped it on our listeners a bit and um, william kidd is a he's commissioned by the british to go and hunt pirates in the indian ocean and then yeah. once he's out there he, he turns around and goes aha well actually i'm going to become a pirate and um, yep. start stealing stuff. Do you think he? Uh, do you think he he decided on the spur of the moment, or or he he was going to do it all along? I don't know that he initially designed it that way. Um, 
I know, for example, he when he was on a ship called uh, Blessed William, uh, his crew mutinied against him because he wouldn't turn pirate. And, you know, in an act of revenge, he offers his services to the newly established English government in New York. And uh, that's sort of his first foray into becoming a pirate hunter uh, with his intention being sort of to take revenge on the crew that mutinied against him. But I think once he saw the, the significant riches that were to be had in the Indian Ocean and the fact that even though a lot of those treasure ships were also in protective convoys, they were not necessarily as protected as, say, the Spanish, I think he just decided, uh, you know what, um, it, you know, I'm not getting paid enough for this, especially when his crew started to turn on him. And he's like, you know what? I'll join you. Let's do this. We'll be pirates. So I, I don't know if it was spur of the moment necessarily. I think it was a, you know, a, a carefully laid out thought, but I don't think it was his initial intention when he, when he received the commission. Yeah. He might have been a literary genius though. Cause I think he was writing his own story. It's fantastic. He killed someone. He kills a <laughs> member of his crew with a bucket, <laughs> which is, yep. which is a kind of a, it's, you couldn't invent a more brilliantly piratical way of killing <laughs> someone, just losing your temper and smashing <laughs> someone's head in with it, with a bucket. Um, but, uh, and, and also there's, um, Oh, I'm just hanging on. I'm talking off the top of my head here, but isn't he executed twice or something? I believe that's the story is that the first uh, attempt at hanging did not do its intended purpose and so they had to try again um, yeah. but I'm not sure how uh, legitimate those those claims were um, I myself haven't really read too much into the the physical uh, evidence we have in terms of, of the written record but that is I think the the overall belief yeah, well, maybe there's a challenge for one of our listeners. So if there's someone out there, you've got a, you've got a bit of time free. I think, uh, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I think <laughs> William Hid is the only man who was executed twice for piracy. And it would be nice to know what we know about that. I bet there are um, uh, newspaper accounts and court records. It should be quite easy to find out about. Just nip down to the British Library. Um, while we're talking about evidence, um, let's carry on. How do we know about these pirates' lives? So the vast majority of information we have regarding the pirates uh, at this time period come from government records, whether those are um, trial transcripts of those who have been caught and accused of piracy, uh, letters from governors to each other, to the Board of Trade and Plantations, to uh, various higher ranking officials, and um, sort of the, the records of ports uh, in terms of ships that are coming in and out uh, and sort of keeping track, if they can, of illegitimate ships uh, who are trying to remain off the record. So that's sort of the vast majority. Um, I also think that a lot of people have turned to the uh, infamous Captain Charles Johnson book, uh, a history of pirates, which, you know, there is some element of truth in that book. Uh, he was a contemporary of the pirates. And uh, so he's getting some information from newspaper accounts and, and that sort of thing. But we also know that he made up a lot of stuff. So it's not the most effective uh, source to use. And then my favorite is to use um, material culture evidence where, when we can find it. Um, sunken ships, uh, goods that had been uh, seized from the pirates, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, for example, there was a great uh, underwater archaeology excavation at Port Royal in Jamaica done by the Nautical Archaeology Program at, I think it was Texas A&M. And uh, you basically get to see what that part of the island looked like in situ, like as it was, because it sort of just fell into the ocean and so the buildings are still sort of laid out where they were you can see objects still in their their spaces uh so that's sort of where i learned a lot about tavern life in um the caribbean specifically 
So those, I think those are the main kinds of evidence. And then the fun evidence would be, uh, you know, we, we have some letters from pirates' families to the pirates and from pirates to their families. Uh, there's also a, a petition from a group of pirates' wives whose husbands had been accused of piracy and sentenced to hang, uh, asking for their pardon. Um, so it's difficult, though, because uh, obviously pirates are not keeping records themselves, <laughs> Uh, for the most part, plausible deniability, very important in that <laughs> line of work. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you just have to sort of read into the sources uh, with the knowledge and understanding that, especially being primarily government records, it is coming from a very particular stance and, and a very particular perspective with a very specific purpose, which is usually to make that individual look good uh, against the pirates. Yeah. I mean, in terms of archaeology, I mean, they, it's claimed that the Queen Anne's Revenge Blackbeard's ship has been discovered and the Wydar, um Sam Bellamy's ship. Is that Sam Bellamy's ship? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, do you know anything about those two? So I, I've read a bit about the alleged Queen Anne's Revenge ex or the excavation of the alleged Queen Anne's Revenge. I I mean, they've found some really interesting evidence that, that sort of points towards it being the actual Queen Anne's Revenge. But at the same time, I think it's difficult to say with certainty just because there are no specific markings. There's nothing that's, you know, like, this is Blackbeard's ship and uh, shipwreck excavations can be really difficult because you would think they just sink to the bottom and then that's it. But the, the shifting sands under the water can sometimes shift materials um, away from the original location. And so it's, it's really interesting how um, shipwreck archeologists uh, and scholars sort of understand that material. Um, and for the WIDA, uh, that has, I think, stronger evidence for being the WIDA and being Sam Bellamy's ship based on uh, what we knew about it as a slaving vessel. And we could use that information uh, in relation to the materials they found and, and the structure of the ship and the location is right in terms of uh, what we know about the um, the storm that caused the wider to wreck. Yeah, well, it's it's fascinating. I, I I hope there's more more pirate ships discovered in the future. The beauty of it is, of course, is that we may well have found lots of ships that were used for piracy, but we don't know about it. So yep. we may be sitting sitting on wonderful discoveries already. Um, you've recently done a lot of research on piracy and privateering in and around the area between Long Island and the Delaware Bay. Um, mm -hmm. Relatively small area in the whole history of piracy, uh, but very fascinating. And tell us about why, why did you choose that particular location? I decided to focus on that particular location because as I was researching for my first book, which was on the Chesapeake Bay, I kept coming across records that were specific to primarily New York and Pennsylvania. And I just thought, you know, I would love to have included those stories and that information into the book I was writing. But, you know, especially writing for the history press, it is geographically bedded. And so I was limited to just speaking about the Chesapeake Bay, so Maryland and Virginia. So I collected all that evidence and uh, thought that there was a uh, important enough story to tell about that region uh, and the history press agreed. So um, that's sort of how I fell into writing a book specifically about that, that region. Mm. And what did you what did you discover? I bet the Dutch were up to no good. They always are in maritime history. Okay. So I, I found <laughs> that the uh, the sort of conflict that surrounds the establishment of New York or New Amsterdam, uh, that conflict really sets the the inhabitants up, specifically the merchants and and even the government officials, for supporting and participating in, in piracy 
uh, because they found it to be beneficial in terms of um, supplementing lost incomes or, or um, providing them with certain kinds of benefits. Uh, and so, especially New York, because of it being such a, a prominent port city, um, there's, there's so much trade going in and out. Some of the most uh, wealthy merchants in the whole of the English uh, colonies at that time uh, come from New York. Uh, I think you have uh, William Van Corlant. Um, there, there are so many, and uh, they, they are sort of the, I don't know, the, the Rockefellers of their era. And so uh, I think that just sort of lent itself really well for, for piracy to flourish in that particular region. It's it's lovely being able to focus on these specific geographical areas, whether it's the Caribbean or the Chesapeake Bay or um, you know Long Island and the Delaware. I and mean, it makes you realise just the, the immense scale of piracy mm-hmm. and just how influential it was. So, uh, do you think it's fair to say that pirates are not just historically interesting, but they are also historically important? Oh, absolutely. That was sort of the core argument of my doctoral dissertation, uh, which was then supported by the brilliant book published by Mark Hanna, uh, which came out the year I submitted my dissertation. So um, I found that for a lot of these colonies, uh, especially the English North American colonies and, and several of the colonies throughout the Caribbean, that at least for a period, pirates are incredibly beneficial to those islands' economies and livelihoods. Uh, in many cases, pirates were providing protection for those colonies when the Royal Navy, for example, was incapable of sending vessels to protect their, their colonies from attack by the Spanish or the French. Uh, and so for a lot of people, they, they appreciated the pirates coming to their, their island or their colony because they brought uh, goods, especially goods that may or may not have found their way into that particular colony. Uh, They did so in a way that uh, lowered the price of purchase for those items. And so more people were able to enjoy what we would consider luxury goods than might have otherwise. And uh, it gave the governments a chance to sort of really establish themselves in those regions. Uh, But it turns out the pirates are kind of their own worst enemy in that they're so effective at enabling these colonies to become firmly established and securing their own economies that they reach a point where the pirates are no longer necessary. And so they become viewed as a burden instead. Mm. Well, there you are. You have it. How the the pirates shaped the Atlantic world rather than just tore it all apart. Jamie, thank (laughs) you very much indeed for talking to me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Many thanks indeed for listening. In particular, do please check out the Mariner's Mirror podcast's YouTube channel, TikTok and Instagram, where you will find out some truly magnificent videos, not least the quite brilliant new films on the world's best ship models. Now, this podcast comes from both Lloyd's Register Foundation and the Society for Nautical Research. So please do take the time to check out everything that both of those institutions have been up to. You can find the Lloyd's Register Foundation's History Centre and Archive at hec.lrfoundation.org.uk and the Society for Nautical Research at snr.org.uk where you can join up to enjoy all of the many, many perks of membership including four copies of the printed Mariner's Mirror Journal every year online access to over a century's worth of maritime historical scholarship online seminars and you can even come to dinner on board HMS Victory What a treat! 